Okay, I think we ought to probably continue. So um, let's do just that. So we're headed next to talk about some basic statistical terms. You can either look at this on the course webpage if you want, or you can also open the notebook here. There's actually nothing in these notebook cells in terms of code cell. So I'm gonna go here to the course page and just take a look there at the next part of the lesson. So these are just some general terms that we should perhaps be familiar with in terms of talking about geostatistics. This is not a course that's going to go into statistics in depth, but we have some essential things that we need to talk about that uh, maybe have not been defined for you previously. And one of the things that's kind of motivating this is if you think about things like measuring ages of different geological entities, you know, our methods are continually improving to give us more and more precise ages, but there are still lots of, lots of things that are causing us to have some uncertainty, some variation in the ages and things like that in the materials that we're dating that relate to the geological history. And uh, that's part of, of where we're going to start here. So the first thing to talk about basically is the difference between a population and sample. This is all available for you to read through on the course page. So I'll kind of keep it relatively uh, short here. But the point basically is that what we deal with whenever we go out and collect any kind of geological data is collecting a sample. So the sample that we collect could be a rock sample, could be something else, water sample or, uh, or whatever, sediment, soil, whatever it is. And that sample that we collect, we're hoping is something that can be used to tell us information about a much larger population. So if the population was all of the rocks of a given type, could be all of the Rapakivi granite in Finland, that might be our population. What's available to us at the surface is only a small amount of that, uh, that population. So if we wanted to you know, look at all of the feldspars in some granitic body for whatever reason, uh, of course, we can't look at all of them. It's simply not possible for us to do. We can't access the samples at uh, any sort of substantial depth. And in terms of the work that would be needed, we can never actually analyze the entire population of, I would argue, just about anything geological. We cannot analyze an entire population. So we take a sample. And we hope that by looking at the sample, we learn something about the population. That's the basic, basic idea. And you can see, for instance, some additional information about that uh, on the course page. The overall hope is that the sample is representative. And by being a representative sample, it means that yes, the sample we took can be used to tell us something about the larger population. And typically the way to get a representative sample is to, to collect enough material in your sample that you feel confident you can then use that to infer something about the larger population. So whatever the thing is, if it's minerals that you're dating, if it's fracture orientations, whatever, uh, you need enough data to be able to, to be able to say that the sample is indeed representative. And we try to do this by collecting to the extent that it's possible our samples in a random way. So not biasing to look for minerals only from a certain thin vein of material in part of our sample, but to try to sample across the batholith or whatever to give us a random sample. Now, the thing is a random sample does not guarantee that the sample is a representative sample. So that's what's illustrated here on the course page. You see here a population of different little uh, fossil creatures. So I guess they're, I don't know, trilobites and brachiopods and coral pieces and stuff like that. Um, not a paleontologist and I won't pretend, but these are all little creatures and uh, we could go out and collect a sample of those creatures that might look something like this. And that's just in this case from a random sample of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven creatures out of this, let's call that our population. And if we went back in and took another random sample of seven or more creatures, we could end up with a sample that looks like this. And this obviously in both cases, these, although we have taken all of these samples out of this population, 
they look different. They are not necessarily representative of the population as a whole. Maybe we need to collect more material. Um, and, you know, maybe there's some kind of bias in what we're sampling. So there's a lot of different biases in, in earth science data. You know, it could be preservation bias in terms of what's uh, preserved and what isn't. But ultimately, in this case, two different samples randomly selected and they look different. And if you took this sample and said, okay, I'm going to use that to describe the population, you would probably say like, it looks like it's mostly made up of small creatures. There's some different corals and things like that. Whereas the other population here, I think that's a brachiopod and it's a pretty big thing. And there's some other bigger creatures here and you would just make different conclusions based on those two, those two samples. So randomness in your sampling doesn't guarantee your sample is a representative sample. So that's one of the ideas here. Another example here of a case where random samples from different populations could also be somewhat problematic. So here we have a population of creatures, again, a sample that's taken out of that population in the blue box here. And their sample looks like this. We've got a different group of creatures down beneath it. And uh, you can see there are more of these kind of trilobites there and uh, just a different distribution. The prevalence of different creatures varies, but the sample looks almost identical. Very similar samples in this case. This too can be a problem that just because you have randomly sampled doesn't mean that you capture the differences in two populations. So that is, again, part of the reason why when we do things like measure ages, we don't just take a single measurement and move on, but we try to replicate the ages. We try to make sure that there's not something that's biasing our interpretation. Sometimes there is, and that's part of, uh, of dealing with our data. There are outliers and there are things that we need to try to understand, but um, the fundamental idea basically comes back to this, this random sampling of a population to try to understand uh, the members of that population. So that is basically populations and samples very briefly. And again, please feel free. You can go back on the course page and read this through again if you would like to, to understand it in more detail. Uncertainty is another thing that we have to face. And uh, of course, this is intuitive to us as geoscientists because a lot of the measurements that we take, a lot of things that we date, a lot of materials that we deal with are very much uh, just full of uncertainty. And there's a nice little example here at the start of the cost of operating a drill ship to drill offshore in, uh, in deep water. It costs about 350,000 euros a day for a drill ship. And then oil platform costs about 300,000 euros per day. The point being that if you're trying to locate some sort of hydrocarbons at depth, you want to be fairly sure you've taken into account as many of the uncertainties as possible so that you don't spend several days drilling and uh, have racked up a multi-million euro bill and end up hitting nothing that is a proven resource. So uncertainty is something that we have to, we have to sort of embrace and deal with, and that's probably no surprise. A couple concepts here that we can talk about uh, relate to uh, what we can define as precision and accuracy. So this is what's shown in these these uh, figures down below. So if you think about it, I probably all of you have been out in the field before with a compass. You take measurements of orientations of some uh, fold or fault or some other kind of um, feature in, in the rock with the compass. Needle points in a di certain direction. And if you have a compass, most of them will have some kind of graduation, some sort of ticks on there that maybe are about one degree apart. So the best you could possibly record in any one of your measurements would be some one degree plus or minus 0 0.5 as the precision that you could you could record in your measurement. Um, that's true even you know with extremely precise equipment, there's always going to be some uncertainty in terms of how well we can report our measurements. So we try to minimize the uncertainties, of course, but um, you know that's that's something that can be challenging to do. And we try to minimize things by being as precise and accurate as possible. But those two words may not mean that much or may not be clear what the distinction is between them. So precision tends to be a term that you can use to refer to 
how much variation there is between repeated measurements of the same uh, same item. So if you were measuring the orientation of some structure and you put your compass there, took a measurement and did that 10 times, a precise measurement would show very little variation in the orientation of the compass each time, whereas an imprecise measurement would have larger variation between each of the measurements that you take. So in both of these cases, these points that are kind of all clustered together in this little bullseye diagram, the both the top two cases have a small uh, scatter, a relatively small scatter, which means they're fairly precise measurements. Accuracy has more to do with whether or not you're actually getting the correct solution with what you're with what you're measuring. So, in this case, uh, for instance, in the top two panels, you have here in the case small scatter, so precise measurement, and it's also accurate because it's falling within the bullseye here of this uh, this little diagram. Whereas on the other side, you have precise but not accurate. So these points are all clustered closely together, but they're not actually recording or giving you back the expected value. So that's the kind of key distinction there. Below, you can see an example here of, again, this is accurate in terms of the distribution of points. This is accurate, but of course, it's not very precise. There's a lot of scatter between the points. However, they are scattered around the middle of this plot and the worst case scenario here would be that you have imprecise and inaccurate uh, results. But you can find a little bit of the description here. Precise measurement has a small random error between measurements. So that's the idea, like with the compass, you go back and take the same measurement 10 times. The random error of you're just putting the compass on the rock slightly differently each time. As long as that's small, you can say that your measurement is precise. An accurate measurement is one that has small systematic error. So this is the error from the known value being small. And uh, of course, we don't necessarily have a way to know whether or not we have systematic errors. Random errors, we can just retake our measurements many times. And if we do that over and over again, repeated measurements will show us whether or not there's a small or a large random error. If you don't know <clears throat> what the age is of something that you're trying to date, for example, or you don't know what the expected orientation is of some structure, then you don't necessarily have a way of telling whether you have systematic errors. So there's reasons and ways to handle this, but this is just the reality. The picture down below here sort of shows what that looks like. So in each of these cases, we can say that we have small random error up here and up here and large random error down in the lower two panels because we can see the points are clustered closely together in both of these two, and they're not clustered closely together in the lower two. However, we have no idea what the systematic error is in the case that we don't know what the known value or the expected value is beforehand. So that's the thing that can be quite challenging to face. And this is one of the reasons why when labs are doing dating of samples, they repeatedly go back and date something like a standard because that standard will tell you whether or not your equipment is measuring the expected value and giving back the expected value. So if you have some standard that you know has a certain age, you should hope that your dating equipment, whatever instrument you're using, gives you something close to that age every time you go back and measure the standard. So that is the kind of idea of random and, and systematic error, precision and imprecision, uh, accuracy and inaccuracy. And again, please feel free to go back and have a look at the, the course page here if you have any questions about that. So as we move a little bit closer to the exercise for today, we can talk about how we report measurements. This is something that's probably, uh, if you've taken an introductory physics course, this is something that often comes up there. Just the way in which we want to report our values. And the typical way of doing that is to take something like our best estimate of what the value is that we've measured, plus or minus some uncertainty. So if we think about the compass example, we might say, okay, it's 300 degrees is the best estimate of which way the compass needle is pointing, plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees. And uh, this X best will depend a little bit on what you are actually 
measuring. And there's several different ways in which you can calculate what that kind of best estimate might be. But the basic idea is that for anything we measure, since we are not afraid of the uncertainties, we'll say we have the value plus or minus some uncertainty. One of the things we can use to give us an estimate of X best is the mean. So this is the average value of a set of measurements. Again, think about the compass on the rock measuring the orientation of some structure. You maybe have taken some five or 10 measurements. And if you sum those 10 measurements together and divide by 10 in terms of the orientation, you sum them all up and divide by 10, that should give you the average orientation of the structure that you've measured. And you could think about that, for instance, as your best, your X best value for those 10 measurements. So mean function looks like this. This is probably pretty intuitive to you because basically you just add up some things and divide by the number of things you've added up to get the average value. If you don't know what this sigma notation is, so this is the big Greek letter sigma here, uh, there is something in this week's exercise hints. I guess actually I can just pull that up very quickly here because I think it's right at the top. Of, there's a thing about sigma notation and how it works. So um, you won't see it a ton in the course, but it's something familiar, uh, hopefully. And if not, you can have a look here on the course page to see what sigma notation is and how it works. But basically, we're summing up the values we've measured and dividing by the number to get the average. That's our mean. Now, when it comes to looking at things like how much do the values differ from one another, a natural thing to want to do is to take something like the deviation or the residual of each measurement. So the deviation, in this case, D of I, because this is the deviation for a single measurement, is simply the difference, the signed difference between the measured and the mean value. So the deviation here would be some measurement you've taken, one of your measurements of the orientation of some rock unit, minus the average. So if your value was higher than normal or higher than expected, you get a positive deviation. If it's lower than expected, you get a negative deviation. Okay, very easy way to see whether or not uh, your value is right on the mean or far away from the mean. A small deviation would be indicative of precise measurements. And in this way, you might be tempted to then just say, oh, well, let's just calculate the deviation for every one of the things I measured, add them all up, and that way I'll know right away whether or not my, uh, my values on average are close to the mean value. The problem is if you sum up all of your deviations, you get back exactly zero. And that comes from the way in which the mean is calculated, that if you do that summation, and uh, what you'll end up with is your deviations will sum to zero. For that reason, instead to measure this kind of how much do the values differ from one another thing, uh, we use a form here for the standard deviation. So this is why you can't just take the deviations themselves, but you have to use something a little bit different. What we do in this case is we can take all of our differences like we had before, xi minus x, that looks familiar right here, but we square the values and sum them up. By squaring them, we now lose whether they're positive or negative, but just simply how far away from the mean value are you? And in that way, if a value is overestimated and underestimated, when you average them together, you don't get zero, but you get something that's going to still be telling you how far away on average is the value from the mean value. You sum all of those up, you divide by the number of measurements that you have in your summation, and you take the square root of that, and that is the standard deviation. So that is one way in which we can see how far values are on average from the mean value that is measured. And again, with a standard deviation, if the standard deviation is small, that would be indicating that our measurements are precise. If the standard deviation is large, of course, the converse is true, meaning that the, the measurements are not very precise and that the random error is large. So this is a uh, yeah, basic calculation of the standard deviation. One thing to watch out for here uh, 
is that there are two different ways in which standard deviation can be calculated. The one above is, I think, the kind of simplest case. But the thing is that if you have a single measurement here, this still will come back with some value uh, that doesn't necessarily make sense for what your standard deviation would be. So uh, in fact, what it will do is you'll notice if you have a single value, the average of that single value will be the value itself. So then this will be zero when you subtract the two, which would suggest your standard deviation is zero, which might make you think, oh, I have infinitely precise measurements. That's not necessarily the reality. So instead, there's another version of the same equation here. It looks very similar, except for the bottom has n minus one. So that if you have a single value here, this one over n minus one, is gonna give you one over zero, or in other words, that this will be undefined, which is telling you essentially that your standard deviation is not defined for a single value, which perhaps mathematically is a better way to describe standard deviation. Of course, this will have some small effect on the values that you're measuring here. But again, if, if the value of n is fairly large, that difference between the two equations should go away with increasing numbers of, of measurements. So one more thing that we can talk about here uh, in our set of our basic statistics is the standard error. You've probably also heard about standard error before and maybe do or do not have some sense of what the standard error tells you, but it is basically just the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of samples. And what this means is that this value, if the standard deviation is not changing, this value will get smaller as the number of samples increases. So this is a little different than the standard deviation. And this last little section down here at the bottom uh, kind of addresses that point. The standard deviation is meant to tell you how far a value deviates from the average. So is it close to the average value or is it far away from the average value? The standard error is meant to give you an estimate of how much the mean uh, value is varying. So it measures the uncertainty in the estimate of the mean. So it's, uh, it's a little different. I think in most cases for this course, we're gonna to stick to using standard deviation because we're essentially interested in the uncertainty that from the random error in our data sets that we're working with, but, but it's included here for the sake of completeness. The, the standard error is also here. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna say a little bit here about the normal distribution, and then I'll give you a little preview of our exercise, and we can have some, some time for questions and discussion perhaps uh, as well. Maybe we'll, we'll have a little time for questions after this next little piece of the lesson here. So one other thing we'll deal with in the exercise for today is the normal distribution, also sometimes called the Gaussian distribution. Um, and it's basically a mathematical function that, that makes a plot like this bell shaped curve. that shows you if our mean value our expected or average value is here in the middle, that the probability if we randomly sampled out of our distribution is that uh, we're gonna get something close to the mean most likely, but of course there may be some samples that are less common that deviate farther from the mean and uh, and we may still select them upon a random sample. But if we randomly sampled this, um, in this case, these are average cinder cone slope angles. So this is like the slope on the side of the cinder cone. Uh, on average, they seem to cluster around a certain value, but there are some that are less and some that are greater than that value. And if we randomly selected cinder cones all over the world, we'd expect to be getting values close to the mean most of the time. So this is something that can be used to describe many different uh, geological uh, features. You could also think about it as, uh, you know, with our compass example that on average, if we keep measuring the same rock unit with the compass, we would expect most often to be getting values close to the average. And then maybe every once in a while, you put the compass in a weird spot and you get a bad value. but. Uh, but the majority of the time they will be close to the mean. And so this then probability distribution will be highest around the mean value and then decay away from there, meaning the probability of a random sample being close to the mean is highest and further 
away you go, the less likely it is to get one of those. So you can see here, this is again, a couple of Gaussian distributions showing plus or minus one standard deviation. So within this range here, random sampling should give us like 68% roughly um, of the samples that we would collect. So if we randomly measured rock orientation is just taking repeated measurements on some face, most of the time we'd get a measurement that's between this range here, uh, which is one standard deviation from the mean. Two standard deviations is simply uh, twice that distance away. So twice the distance from the mean value. And again, in this case, within this range of sort of the small end to the higher end of our range of cinder cone angles, we would expect to see in, in here about 95% of all of the cinder cones would fall within two standard deviations of the mean value. And again, maybe that's something you've, you've previously seen. So you can see those numbers sort of highlighted, highlighted here. And in the exercise this week, we'll, we'll play a little bit more with normal distributions. So that was quite quick and to the point, again, partially because this is on the course webpage. But yeah, I guess I'd like to know at this point, are there any questions or do you have any, any things that were unclear you'd like me to go over again? So not seeing anything. If you do have questions, you can, of course, put them in, in the chat. And uh, if I don't see anything, then my assumption is that you don't have any questions, which is makes me a little bit uneasy. It's good in a sense. Maybe you're totally following everything. No problem. It's all you know, very easy for you to understand. No worries or you're just not listening anymore and doing something else. So uh, I know how this works on Zoom. And unfortunately, with this lesson, there were a couple places where we could have done a little bit of interactive Python stuff, but it wasn't really, it was kind of like, um, not necessarily very geologically motivated, more like, you know, oh, look how this equation works, which is part of what we want to do. but. Uh, I think it's better that we try to do that with the geological motivation so that you're maybe intrinsically more interested than just some toy examples of how to plot points that are within one standard deviation of one another. So, okay, well, I will proceed then at this point. And what I will show you here then is our exercise for this week. So again, this will look a lot like what happened in the GeoPython course. If, uh, if you haven't taken that, then there may be some new things here. We're going to be using uh, Git and GitHub Classroom for the exercises. And this is something that's discussed in the GeoPython course. Uh, I think... Uh, do I have that open here? Still, I do. So there's some things in lesson two about Git and GitHub Classroom. If those don't sound familiar to you at all, I would encourage you to go have a look at the GeoPython course page to see a little bit about Git and GitHub Classroom. We don't need that to take a look at the exercise right now, but you will need that for uh, turning in the exercises and working on the exercises in, in this course. So just a heads up there. But yeah, if it, I'm just going to click on the link here that will take us to uh, exercise one. I think I actually already have that open over here. So maybe I will leave this on the course page and jump to this tab where exercise one is already open. So this is basically about coding and visualizing geostatistics. That's the theme for this, this exercise. And in this case, uh, it's out of 20 points. So don't worry if you're used to the GeoPython course where the exercises were out of 10 points. 
It's all just arbitrary. It's worth 50% of your grade. So I just did 20 points here because it was a little bit easier uh, than 15 or than 10 points rather um, to break down the points for different problems. So there's 20 points, um, but yeah, whatever. The exercises combined are worth um, worth half of your grade and each exercise will be worth 20 points. So they're all worth equal amounts. I have a nice little example here of the motivation for this exercise. Uh, that's uh, some little fake. Oh no, it didn't format properly. Oh, that doesn't look very nice here. Um, I'll have to try to fix the formatting at some point, but this is a little dialogue between you and your uncle Ismo and, uh, and uncle Ismo's unimpressed with your geological knowledge. So, um, he's interested in volcanoes and things like that. And you don't know the answers to his questions. And that's the kind of motivation here is to, to be able to, uh, avoid these kind of embarrassing situations by doing things like data analysis of volcano volcano data that's one of the data sets we'll use today so the smithsonian institution has a global volcanism program and they have data available for a whole bunch of different volcanoes i don't remember how many right offhand but they have a big database and we have the data that we can analyze in this week's lesson to look at things like how much the average elevation of volcanoes varies in different regions and things like that. So this is a, an exercise that's based on using Jupyter Notebooks. This will look familiar to the GeoPython students, but again, if you haven't done it, um, you may want to have a look at some of the GeoPython course info to see how things are working. But I'll click here on the link at the bottom, which just gives us a preview of the exercise uh, notebook. And so there are three problems in the notebook this week, and it's a single, single exercise. The first problem is basically about converting math to Python. Here, we're going to create some new functions, and the functions are going to allow us to do things like calculate the mean, calculate the standard deviation, and the standard error for... Uh, well, that's that's basically just the, the purpose of this first problem is to make these into Python functions. One thing of note is that uh, we have in this exercise, if I go back here just for a second to the file list, you can see the exercise. This is the notebook itself. And then there's this intro QG functions Python code or Python script. There's not much in it, but this is where you're going to fill in the functions that you're asked to create in problem one, for example. So there's a space under here where you can define your new functions below this line. The reason for doing this is that we're going to be putting together a whole set of different functions throughout the different lessons that we work on. And if we put them all into one script file, it's very easy to import and use them week to week rather than having to copy paste them into different notebooks and things like that. We're going to keep this one script file. And this is actually the way that a lot of uh, people working in, in Jupyter notebooks would work themselves is they would have a script file that contains the most commonly used functions that they're using so that they can easily load them and use them on demand. We covered how to do this in lesson four, I think, in the GeoPython course. Um, yep. So in the lesson on functions in the GeoPython course, we talked about how to load and how to use uh, script files so that if you had a script file here, like our intro QG functions with your functions in it, that you could load that in and use it inside your notebook. So that's uh, one thing to be aware of because you're not going to be writing these functions into the notebooks themselves, but in a separate file. And when you save things at the end, when you're done working on the exercise, make sure that you save and commit your changes and push them for both the exercise notebook and the, the functions file itself. Again, we're going to be using the same functions file um, over and over again. And this is just the first week that we're going to be working with it.
So again, returning here to the, what happened to it, uh, to the first problem. So we're converting math to Python. Basically, we have a mean function that's listed here. We'll create the mean function in the intro QG functions file. And then you'll see in here our kind of test cells. So this is where the function will be loaded from the intro QG function script file and then used to check and see whether you get the expected answer. And uh, so there's some tests there for the mean, for the standard deviation, and for the standard error functions. And that's pretty much it for, for problem number one. You make those functions and you test them out. For problem number two, we're going to do some analysis of our volcano data. And so here we have a data file. Uh, it is this data GVP volcano list Holocene. If you click on it, you can see what the data file looks like. And uh, it's 1,428 lines long. And there's one line here or two lines of headers. So then there's 1,426 volcanoes or something like that that are listed here. So it's quite a significant data file. And uh, well, I don't need to scroll through it because it's not very nice looking in the current form, but, but you can see there's a lot of values that are there. So we're going to use that data file to load into pandas. And once we load it into pandas, you're going to be asked to do a number of data processing steps. Let's see if I can get this to reload. Here we go. So you load the file in, then they're going to do some cleaning of the data and things like that. So you first read it in. This is pretty typical stuff from the GeoPython course to load in a CSV file. And you're told to use the semicolon character as the separator and to skip the first row. Then there's some tests that check to see whether you did that properly. Then there's a data preparation step. So we're going to make a new data frame called clean data. And the clean data is going to be only for volcanoes with elevations above sea level. And we're going to drop any rows where the tectonic setting is listed as NAN or not a number. So that's missing data. And we could just drop those rows entirely from our data frame. After that, it's going to be then doing some global volcano statistics. So we'll calculate the mean elevation of all the volcanoes, standard deviation of all the volcanoes, and standard error in the elevation of all the volcanoes in the clean data data frame. And we'll store that as these three different variables here. And when you run these cells, you should get them printed out to the screen. And that should let you know whether you're on the right track. Part four of the problem is to then calculate some regional volcano statistics. So there's different regions. There's a heading in the data frame called region. And we can pull out our values for the different regions and then calculate what the mean elevation, what the standard deviation is, and what the standard error is for each one of those regions, which is kind of a nice thing to do to see how they compare to one another. So you'll do that in part four. And then you'll make a new data frame out of that data in part five. That should be, there's a couple hints here, but that should be fairly straightforward if you've done this in GeoPython before. And then there's a couple questions for part six that are just basic things about what you saw. That's problem number two. And then lastly, problem three is about visualizing our uncertainty. So we're going to start by making some bar plots of our regional volcano data. So this will be like one bar for each region. It should be very straightforward to do that with our regional data data frame. But what we're going to add to that bar plot is an error bar that shows the standard deviation and elevation. So the bar plot would show the average elevation of the volcano, and then the error bar would show how much the standard deviation is. So we'll do that for uh, all the volcanoes in the region in part one. Part two, you do basically exactly the same thing with the standard error instead of the standard deviation, just so you can see how they, how they compare. And then in part three, we're going to then make our function for calculating the Gaussian 
distribution. So remember that we can look at this as like a bell curve, what the probability of a given elevation occurring is. And all we need to do that is a mean and a standard deviation. And we'll have those for each one of the regions that we're looking at. So we'll make this Gauss function and then we'll test it out in part three. And then part four, we'll calculate what the elevation distributions are for each of the regions. And then finally, in part five, we'll make a plot showing the Gaussian curves for each of the regions of the data that, that we have. So you'll get to see what the probability distributions look like of the elevations of the volcanoes in different regions. And then a couple questions at the end. So it's a decently long exercise. This is a bit different from the GeoPython course because we'll, we'll tend to cover less during the lessons and have a little bit more time spent on the, on the exercises. But, uh, but a lot of these things in this exercise are kind of smaller coding things. So I hope it doesn't feel like it's too, too heavy. It's, it's a you know, number of parts for each one of the problems, but I think what you have to do in each part, um, I think is not necessarily too heavy for each, each piece, but we'll see. The really nice thing this year is that we have our lessons on Monday and our exercise session on Friday, which means you have several days between now when you first see the exercise and Friday when we have the exercise help sessions so that you can come prepared and be ready to uh, ask questions and have some idea already of, of what's going on in this week's exercise. Uh, I think that's all the questions or all the kind of stuff I had to say at this point. Are there questions? I thought I heard someone unmuted for just a second, but maybe not. Do we need to put comments in these codes? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think you should basically kind of automatically be adding some comments when you're writing code in general. So yeah, like the GeoPython course, it's good to include comments. Um, you don't necessarily need a comment for every line of code, but for instance, we're going to make these new functions like the, the mean function, standard deviation. It would be good to include like a short doc string for those functions where it just says in one line, calculates the mean of some set of values or something like that. Some, some short documentation there. If you include a doc string for a small function, probably you don't need any comments on individual lines unless you're doing something sort of, uh, well, that's not immediately obvious. Like calculating the mean, probably everything you would calculate would be quite clear what you're doing. So, but yes, you should include comments. Other questions? I'm not seeing much here. Um, how about we do it like this? So if you're feeling like everything is clear and I don't know, uh, you feel confident that you know how to proceed, maybe you could put a green check mark in the, in the participants list for your reaction. So I can at least get some sense of who feels good about how to proceed. If you feel like you've got questions or concerns, you could also put a red X um, and uh, in that way, then we'll have some idea how things are looking. So I'm seeing lots of green check marks so far. That's good. Okay. Well, um, I can stay on here for a few minutes still after we kind of finish, if there are any questions. I think there were some people whose uh, registration status was somewhat uncertain still. So if you have questions about registering for the course or anything else, uh, I'll stay on for a few minutes. I'm going to stop recording in just a second. But um, yeah, if there aren't any other questions at this point, uh, the links for the exercise and everything should be live. You should be able to go and get your own copy of the exercise number one now.
and uh, you can get started on that. And we'll be present on Friday in the exercise session, or at least Levy will be there. I'll try to pop in um, as well. And uh, we'll be able to give you some, some additional guidance there. Once we know if we have a classroom reserved, I'll put a message in Slack in the intro Q, Q, QG general uh, channel. And um, in, in that message, I can tell you where we would meet on Friday. And I might also ask uh, you know, if, if anybody needs us to be online or if people are okay to meet in person. But yeah, I think at this point, we've covered everything for, for our lesson and exercise number one. And uh, I would say best of luck getting started with the exercise. And we'll see you on Friday, hopefully in person, for the exercise session. So uh, yeah, we'll see you Friday. And if not, we'll catch you next week here in Zoom.